going to start talking about what happens when you die. Aren't you glad you came to church today? I don't know why we don't want to talk about this. This is so important, right? It's extremely important. It's like people graduating high school or college, and we never talk about graduation day. There comes a time where you and I are going to end our lives. Now, unless, unless God comes back and takes it and comes back the second time, all of us are going to have to face death. In fact, uh, 100% of us, unless Christ comes back, are going to die. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to die. And tell them, I hope not this service. But truth is, we are. In fact, there's only about two. There's two people in Scripture that never faced death. First one was Enoch. The Bible says Enoch walked with God and was no more. God just took him. He was so close to God that he just... The, the veil between the spiritual realm and the natural realm was so thin because he was so close to God. God just took him. Another person is the name of Elijah. Elijah, God took him as well. He never faced death. Everyone else faced death. Even Jesus had to face death, and he was the one that broke it for us. He's the second Adam that broke it so we could follow him. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. All right, and so it's important we understand that. So I want to ask you, and, and you, what happens right after you die? What takes place? And there's a lot of confusion because people say, wait a minute, be absent from the body, be absent from the body, present with the Lord, but then they say that you're going to be buried and going to rise again. So which is it? Do I get buried and, and do I soul sleep? Do I go into some kind of hibernation thing like a bear? Uh, and I wake up in spring? Uh, do I just go to heaven? Am I flooding around? Am I... Am I in some cloud someplace? Am I uh, a bunch of naked babies shooting bows and arrows with little, little wings? To me, that would be hell. I don't know about you. That, that would be hell. If hell is like white clouds and naked children shooting bows and arrows, no thank you. Okay, that's not heaven or hell. But what happens right after you die? And so what happened was, this has been a very personal to me, obviously, because you know, I lost my mom uh, this past uh, February, and, uh, and a lot of you have lost people, and we go through this all the time. What happens when you die? So we're going to look at it today. Okay, a little bit different today than normal, but I think it's important we understand this. And I think Dr. Frankel began that conversation in the teaching last week, so I'm going to kind of bring more completion to it and flush it out just a little bit. Okay, guys, let's pray. Father, I ask that you would honor the message today, Father, because it's your word. And I thank you, Father, you do not leave us as orphans, but you tell us what we need to know. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, the Thessalonian church was going through difficulty, and the Apostle Paul is writing them because they were struggling what's going to happen. They didn't know if you're going to be risen from the dead or not. There was all kinds of talk going on. There was all kinds of heresies going on. So the Apostle Paul was writing to this church and telling them, hey, listen, guys, this is what happens when you die, so I want to give you understanding. So we're going to launch from this, okay? Then after we launch from that, we're going to look what Jesus has to say, and then we're going to look at what happens when you die and what happens at the end of the world. So it's a little confusing, but hopefully by our time today, you're going to have more clarity, all right? That's important. So here we go. The Apostle Paul said this, but I do not want you to be what? Ignorant, all right? Brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, and that is the Greek phrase for those that have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now, the Greek phrase there, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope, it means it's appropriate to sorrow. You're not a bad person if you, if you mourn the death of somebody. In fact, the shortest verse in the English Bible is Jesus wept, and it took place at Lazarus, who he was going to raise from the dead. We don't know the exact reason why Jesus cried. There's a lot of philosophy about it. All we know is that he felt the pain of the moment, and he wept. And he weeps when he sees us in pain. I never forget, my daughter had this, this, this horrible rat thing. It was like a hamster, and I hated the thing. It was ugly, it was disgusting, it spread disease. I, 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 don't like varmint, I don't like mice. But the thing, you know, it constantly dropping everywhere. It's just annoying. And then at night, you hear... This thing would be on the wheel, uh, constantly on the wheel, and then we'd have to put oil on it, and, and, and it, was, it did nothing during the day, but at night it kept us awake. So anyhow, my daughter loved this thing. It was like her baby, and then the, the thing died. Okay, so I take it in the backyard. 
My daughter's crying. Guess what I did? I cried <laughs> over a little rat. Why did I cry over that little rat? Because I love my daughter. And if it hurts her, it hurts me. So God understands your pain. He understands the loss. He understands what it feels like when you lose someone you love. And I've been mourning myself. I'm not, I, I'm not some great person that I'm mourning, but I, I've, let's just say my heart has grown a little bit larger through what I've gone through because losing a mother and losing a father are two different types of love. But you know about this, right? And so, but we have hope. Why is that? We know that there's something beyond this world. So we hope, we sorrow with hope. So it's okay to mourn. It, God wants us to mourn. If you don't mourn, that's not healthy. That's part of the healing process. God gave us mourning. So if you're going through something, we need to mourn. And we need to talk about death. In our culture, we don't like to talk about it, do we? We avoid it. It's something so important. And it's something a part of life. And how you think about eternity determines how you live today. So it's very important we get it right. So the Apostle Paul is going on. I don't want you being ignorant for those that have fallen asleep, that you sorrow as those who have no hope. We have hope. People would say, well, what about people who don't know Jesus? Then what? I lost my father. I lost my mother. They didn't know God. Are they burning in hell in the shish kebab? I mean, I'm sorry to be so crude, but that's what people think, you know? It's just God sitting there torturing them forever and ever. Is that the kind of God we have? It's gonna torture people and burn in hell forever. And people don't like that whole thing. I don't like hell. So what do we do? We make it up. I don't believe in hell. Well, guys, we don't make the rules up. Uh, I would say that a lot of times what happens is that we take things of the Bible and we expand upon them that the Bible never said. First of all, you and I don't have the capacity to tell anyone where they're gonna go. God determines that, not me. Your job and my job is to tell them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But we don't determine who goes to hell and heaven. So we gotta knock that off, which we'll talk more about in a few moments. We don't determine who goes. I'm a courier. I tell the news. Jesus is the only way. He's the only truth. He's only a life. Well, what about those that are, what about the pygmies in Africa and they never heard the gospel? You think God's going to send them to hell? I don't want to serve a God like that. Da, 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 da. And they, people go off on it and say, I don't believe in hell. And, and so they make their own religion. Like, like we have the power to, to change God. God is God, everybody. You can't change God. He is who he is. And how arrogant and foolish for us to think that we can change it because we don't like it. Give me a break. And a lot of people today are changing Christianity. I don't think it's right. I think it's God should allow everyone to be the same. I think it's okay. God, love is love, and this is the other, and we're going to redefine everything. Sorry, you don't have that capacity. You cannot redefine what God's created. God made the rules. You did not. You're not God. I'm not God. And you're fooling yourself, and I'm fooling myself if we think we can change it. But I, I, am, not, I am not the, I'm not a tribunal. I, I'm not up there with a scorecard saying who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. That's not my job. And that's not your job either. Our job is to tell people that Jesus is the only way, truth, and the life. And let God deal. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about in a few moments more about this, okay? So those who have fallen asleep. So I do not want you to be ignorant and sorrow like those that have no hope. Now, for if we believe that Jesus died, which we do, and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Wait a minute here. So are we telling me when we die, we go into hibernation? Are we in soul sleep? Is there like a purgatory or something like that, that we got to pray for Aunt Martha in South Dakota, praying that she gets saved? Is that what we need to do? By the way, let me just stop here for a second. There's no purgatory anywhere in Scripture. We love our Catholic brothers and sisters, okay? They have a church tradition uh, called syncretism, where they have things that have happened in the Roman culture, and they syncretize some of the things in the belief systems of the Roman culture and the paganism, praying to ancestors, and they kind of synced it in a little bit and made them saints. That we pray, we never pray to our saints, we never pray to people. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever tell you to pray to any of your ancestors. Okay? We have a great cloud of witnesses, that's true, but always, anyone that's of Jesus Christ, anyone that's of God, always points to Jesus, never points to themselves. Anything that points to themselves is usually a, a, is a demon or a false religion. You look in the scriptures, any angel that shows up, any, any, even the apostle Paul says, hey, don't worship, but worship God. Anyone that brings attention to themselves as the source of everything usually is a cult or is a demonic delusion. So 
So if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. So basically he was saying, okay, you die. What happens is, we'll, we'll explain what happens when you die. All right, bear with me. But what happens, you bury the body. And then what happens when Christ comes back, those that are dead first, those that are dead, will rise first, and then we'll meet them together. Now, what does that mean? That's fairly confusing. I know what it is. We'll get it settled. Just hang out. All right? So, the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So, those that are dead are going to rise first. We saw a little bit of this when Jesus rose from the dead. We had people that, uh, we had people that were living prior to that, came in Jerusalem, and they went to heaven. It's a little confusing. I'm not going to get into it right now. But we do know this, those that are dead will rise first, and they're going to receive glorified bodies. All right? You're like, oh, okay, so that means that uh, Aunt Martha is at the graveyard, and so we got to be careful when we mow the lawn when I wake them up. Is that what's going on? No. Hang, hang on. Hang on, everybody. Okay. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and then we shall always be with them comfort one another with these words. Okay, now I'm thoroughly confused. So you're telling me that we die, we go on the ground, we decompose, we're in soul sleep, I guess, right? And, uh, and then one day, Jesus comes back, we rise up again, and then those that are here meet him and come down. Yes, that's what happens with the reconstituted of bodies, but what happens when you die right now? What, what takes place when you die right now? What happens to people? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question. Salvation is in Christ alone, okay? First of all, I want you to track with me now. Jesus is the what? Only way to heaven. He's the only way. Not, not through Islam, not through Buddhism, not through any Hinduism, no other isms in the world. Jesus is the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's extremely narrow-minded. Yes, Jesus says narrow is the road that leads to salvation. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Jesus is the only way to God, period. But what about those that never hear the message of Jesus Christ? I don't know exactly what's going to happen to them, but I do know this. They're going to have to go through Jesus. They're going to have to go through Jesus. The only assurance of salvation is through Jesus. There's salvation found in no other name but Jesus. So they're going to have to go through Jesus. And Jesus is going to determine what's going to happen. What happens if they're, they're really nice Muslims? God's going to send them to hell because I don't know what God is going to do except the only assurance is through Jesus Christ. Let me try to give you an example. Now, uh, for example, we're, we're looking to, um, to put a well in one of these third world countries because the dirty drinking water causes needless suffering that doesn't need to happen, right? So we like to drill a well for about $50,000 or something like that, and we can help a community and make a difference, right? And so what we want to do is bring good, good water so they don't die. So when you and I spread the gospel, we change the, the false systems of the world that are toxic, that are killing people, and we give them fresh water, all right? So what we're doing is we're spreading the gospel, and that gospel is Jesus Christ. So that's why we want to make the world a different place. If it didn't matter, Jesus would never say, go into all the earth. He would say, hey, guys, you know what? I'll work it out in the end. You just hang out here, and I'll work it out. No, he says, I want you to go. I want you to spread the gospel from all the earth because it does matter. Okay, is that clear? It matters. But what happens is we forget our part. Our part is to spread the gospel and speak the truth. Our job's not to say who goes to heaven and go, who goes to hell. We don't determine that. Is that clear? We just share the gospel and tell people that unless they are saved through Jesus, they're not gonna make it. That's the truth. But I don't know how to judge every single person. That's not my purpose. And God is going to judge every person based upon how they respond to Jesus. And that's why it's our responsibility, like putting a fresh water wells in different countries, right? We want to help people to be healthy. 
All right? So Jesus is the only way to heaven. There's no other way. In fact, if you think about it as an illustration, imagine, if you will, that we're in the Arctic Circle and it's frozen and you cannot navigate any boats. It's completely frozen. What they'll have is an icebreaker. They'll put it on a ship and it breaks the ice and then the ships will follow that icebreaker. Jesus is the icebreaker. Without him, there's no entrance into the kingdom of heaven. We have to follow through him. He's the path. He's the gate. He is the only way. And I made, it's not hateful to say that. It's hateful not to say that. It's hateful not to say that. So Jesus said to him, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. There's no other way. No, no other name is salvation except for him. Jesus says, I, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Nor is there salvation in what? In any other. The Bible is explicitly clear. All roads do not lead to heaven. It's not the United Nations Chapel. We have all the world religions on the top of the door. You open the door, it's just one same thing. It's not the same thing. But how arrogant are you? What about all those other people? Listen, God is going to deal with every person. And God will judge the person based on how they respond to Jesus. And the scary part is, here's the scary part. When you and I know the truth and don't want to respond to the truth we know, we lose the ability to tell the truth. In Romans chapter 1, it says, although they knew God, they did not honor God or give thanks to God. For what could be seen about God is obvious in his creation. So God will give a revelation of himself, and he'll reveal himself. There are people seeing visions of Jesus in mosques in, in Malaysia. When I was in Malaysia this the past week, about a very movie, cast a demon out of a Buddhist woman, and she gave her life to Christ. Well, we were there. So, I mean, things are happening. People are coming to know Christ. And they're deceived. They need to know the truth. They're drinking diseased water. You, you follow me, everybody? We have to spread the gospel. So it does matter. Okay? So there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So when you die, three things happen. Are you guys ready for this? All right. Your body returns to the dust. It does. We know that for now, and it comes back to dust. In fact, you know, the first dead body I saw was my grandmother. My grandmother passed away in 1984, and, uh, and I, my mother said, I want you to see your grandma, and I'm glad I did. I mean, it was, it was shocking, but I realized that's not my grandmother's body. It's just a shell. She's just a shell. And I realized that she was not there. You could actually see it. And when my mother passed away recently, I wanted to see the body. And so you might think I'm a little crazy to say this, but I, I, I happen to believe the word of God, and I believe God's word is true. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not. And I honestly believe, God, you could raise her up. So I went to the morgue. I unzipped the bag with the, with the people. And I, I looked at my mother, and I said, God, you're able to raise her up again. And I just, I didn't think it was God's will, obviously. And, oh, come on, pastor, you're going to raise And I'm not going to raise the dead. The Bible says, let, raise the dead. Heal the sick. It's in the Bible. I believe it. It happens. How come we don't see it happen a lot? Well, it does happen in certain parts. It does happen in the world today. Pastor, you've lost your mind. Yeah, maybe I've lost my mind, but I'd rather be a fool for Christ. <laughs> I believe the word of God. And there are people that, there, that literally does happen. Occasionally it does happen. So, I mean, I, I'm at the point. And, and so I saw my mom there, and I realized she wasn't there. Now, what do I say that for? Because I really wanted to, I, I, I want a closure, number one. Number two, I wanted to be able to, to relieve God what's going to happen and, and have an understanding of what's happening. And I wanted to make sure. And I knew she wasn't there. Clearly she was not there. There's something different. Your body returns to the dust. So what happens is your body, people say, okay, so should we cremate our bodies? See, in, in antiquity, they, they were afraid. If you want to curse somebody, you'd burn their bones because when the resurrection comes, guys would be like, oops, there's nothing there. So we can't resurrect the body. Well, we know better now that everything turns to dust. So God can resurrect the body, okay? So it doesn't mean if you get cremated, you're done with the person, okay? Is that, cre is that, is that clear? Okay, good. Your body returns to the dust. That's what happens. Number two, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So you come from God, 
And, and you come to your body, and then what happens? You leave your body, and your spirit goes to the Lord. That's what happens until the day of a reconstitution. Your body returns to the dust. Your spirit returns to God who gave it. And then, and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Wait a minute. I thought we were going to be under the ground. Now, hang on. Jesus was on the cross. He had two thieves. One thief was mocking him. The other thief was like, you know what? This guy did nothing wrong. He's right. Basically, the man gave his life to Christ. Didn't go to church, didn't get baptized. He gave his life to Jesus. It's not about what we do. It's about what Jesus has done. If we accept Jesus and give our life to Jesus, we're saved. That's good news, everybody. So the man said to him, uh, Jesus said to him, as surely I tell you today, today you'll be with me in paradise. So basically, what does today mean? It means today means today. <laughs> this very moment. In a few moments, when you close your eyes and you're dead, you're going to be with me in paradise. What's paradise? I'm so glad you asked. Because paradise is not heaven. It's in the heaven realm, but it's not heaven. You see, God's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. There's a place called Hades, and there's a place called heaven. Jesus gave the illustration and a parable about, um, about a guy named Lazarus, who was very poor and a rich man. And Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom, which is like paradise, while the other guy's in a place of torment, which is Hades. And so, um, for lack of a better term, my parents, uh, they moved to New Jersey, and they were building a house. Before they moved into their house, they moved into an apartment complex. It was a nice one. Had a pool, a tennis court. And we loved it. We went over there, hung out, went to the gym. That's why I'm so large now. Anyhow, we did all that. And, uh, and it, was, it was a temporary dwelling until their house was made. So, when people die, one day he is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. But right now, for those that are in Christ, when you die, you're with Jesus in a place called paradise. It is amazing. There's no sickness. I mean, you're per you have no problems. It is in a beautiful place where you are with Jesus in paradise. You can kind of see what took place a little bit. There's some inferences we can see in Scripture, for example. Um, it seems like, according to Hebrews chapter 11, that there's a great cloud of witnesses. We believe we're with other people. I think we're able, I don't know if we're able to watch down here or not. I don't know. Well, I don't know for sure. I have my suspicions, but I don't want to make a doctrine out of conjecture. But we're going to be in a place called paradise. And, our, and they're with us. Okay? They're not far from us but we never pray to our ancestors. You don't pray to your mother. You don't pray to your father. You don't do that. And if, and if they truly are in heaven, they'd say, don't pray to me, pray to God. Okay? Never is that in Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture do you ever pray to anybody. The only person that did that was Samuel, when he, I'm sorry, when it's Saul, when he tried to get a hold of Samuel with Richard Vandor. And so what happens is we can also see in Scripture, for example, and Mount Transfiguration where Jesus is is talking to Elijah and Moses. So there seems to be like they were waiting. So there seems to be some sort of waiting thing. But this place in paradise is out of our space and time. It's not confined to the, to the clock, to the chronos. It's not confined to our, the natural laws that we're living in this realm. But it's, it's, it's a parallel, but it's a different realm. And it's a paradise. And so it's good, believe me. You are in paradise. You are with Jesus. You have peace. It's fantastic. Now, are you like a, are you some kind of spirit that's flying around? Uh, we don't know exactly at that point what it's going to be like. We don't know. And I can conjecture. I could give you scriptures. I could give you philosophies. It'd be very interesting over a cup of coffee, but I don't want to waste my time with that. Let's just say it's good. It's paradise. If you're not with Christ, you're in a place called Hades. It's torment. Basically, everything good is in God. Suck love, suck hope, peace, joy, mental wellness, take it all away. What are you left with? Chaotic, dread, anxiety, fear. That's what hell is like. You're in a county jail. And by the way, there's no, no chance to make it right. You have one chance. It's on this planet, period. It's appointed a man to die once, then comes the judgment. You don't pay for you don't you can't pay for your sins later. See, we are confident, yes, 
well pleased, rather to be what? Absent from the body and to be what? Present with the Lord. Where? Great paradise, okay? We'll be with him in paradise. That's good news, everybody, okay? That's very true. And as it's appointed for man to die once, right? We die once. We don't come back. We're not reincarnated. You don't come back as a cat or a dog, okay? You go through this life once. Aren't you glad? I'm so glad I'll come back as a cat. I'd be a mean cat, okay? It's appointed for man to die once, but after this comes the judgment. There's no other time. When you're done with this earth, the exam is done, the pen is on the desk, the paper's in the box, your life will be judged. You'll be judged by God. The people who don't know God and the people who will be with God. There's a great right throne of judgment and there's the bema seat. Uh, what will happen is you and I who know Christ are going to be judged, we're going to be saved, we're going to give rewards based upon how we handle this world. And then there are others who reject Christ and they will go to a place separated from him in a place called hell. Well, I don't like that. Well, tough. Uh, you know, I, I don't, you may not like it, everybody. I don't know why we think as Americans we can just change everything. I mean, give me a break. The Bible's the Bible. God is God. You're not God. I don't care if you don't like hell or not. It's not my problem. It's, it's, it, you follow me, everybody? We got to stop all this. Well, I don't like it. Therefore, it's going to be different. Oh, that's silly. That's arrogant. That's foolish. I don't believe two plus two equals four. I think it should be five. Well, go right ahead and see how your bank account goes. <laughs> and as they're pointing for men to die once, but after this comes the judgment. Okay, so your body returns to dust, your spirit returns to God, and spirit goes either to paradise or Hades until the last judgment. Then the books will be open and God will judge your life and he'll look at all your stuff and says, paid in full by Jesus. Hallelujah. Paid in full by Jesus. That's good news, everybody. What about those who never gave their lives to Christ? I don't know, but I know this. God is the most wonderful God there ever was. He's all fair. He's just. He's righteous. I will trust my Lord and my Savior to deal with those who don't know him. That's his job, not mine. I'm not going to be presumptuous and say what's going to happen, but will, will not God do the right thing? Of course. Why will he not do the right thing? Because everything God does is right, and your right is not right. And it would be horrible for God to allow sin to remain. So is that clear, everybody? We don't, we don't go around saying who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. We don't have that horrible luxury, if you can call it that. And, and, and if you want someone to go to hell, don't ever share the gospel with them. You should not want anyone to be separated from God. And that's part of the truth here. Okay, so here's Jesus talking about, as we're gonna get ready to conclude. Let not your heart be troubled. Why? You believe in God, believe also in me. In my what? Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you don't know where you're going. He says, where are you going? Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I am the life. So Jesus prepares a way for us. We don't have all the details, everybody. A lot of it is speculative. A lot of it is theory, and it's fine to talk about, but let's not divide the church over theory. Let's God give us enough need-to-know basis, like they do in the military. They give you a need-to-know basis, what the missions are called. They tell you the mission. They don't tell you what's going on in the war room. They tell you what, what the mission is. We just do the mission and let the Lord deal with the war room. It's okay to think about it. It's okay to speculate, but we cannot divide over speculation. All right? And do not, what Jesus says, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and the body and hell. Jesus talks a lot about hell. Here's one of the most sobering passages of Scripture. This is the sweet Jesus we talk about. Oh, Jesus would never hurt a fly. Yeah, he will. He'll kill the Lord of the flies, Beelzebub. Jesus is not some kind of, it costs Jesus everything to come and die for us. This is what Jesus says. This is very sobering, everybody. It says, many will say to me, in that day. And by the way, the many is a lot. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like incredible amount. It's like a, 
an uncalculable flow. That's how much. Many will say to me that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Oh, he's such a good prophet. He prophesied over me. Oh, he's got such an anointing. Do we not cast out demons in your name? And then many wonders in your name. So what happens is we tend to celebrate people's success. We, we, we tend to celebrate if someone is successful, if the pastor is, is good looking. That's why I'm not good looking. If the pastor is good looking and he's handsome and he's a good business leader and he's smooth with the tongue and the church is growing and they're giving money to the poor, it must be the Lord. It must be God. And what happens, we begin to celebrate success instead of Jesus. It becomes about how successful someone is. And what happens, we turn a blind eye to character. We turn a blind eye to Jesus and we start worshiping different ministries. Oh, that church is the great. Don't, oh, our church is no, our church is not the best church. Jesus is the only best. Seriously. If it comes about, oh, of our pastor, he's someone, oh, please give me a break. I don't, we don't need that. There are things going on right now in the body of Christ. They're very disturbing. One of the major leaders in our vernacular of church back in 1982, and this is not conjecture, committed pedophilia with a young girl. And then years go by and they give him church discipline and they put him back in the pulpit. Then he grows one of the top three churches in America today. And it's all based upon a guy's lie. How could you do something like that? Listen, if I ever did anything like that, I would never step in the pulpit again. And if I ever do anything remotely like that, throw me off the stage. I never want to prepare and, and bring the word of God if I'm living a dual life. But we, we turn a blind eye because he's anointed. He's a good speaker. Look at all he's done. So what? I'm not saying it's not important to have a good church. It's important to have good organization. It's important to have excellence. It's important to have, to, to, to have a church that's healthy and affecting the community in the world. That's all fine. That's all wonderful. But at what cost? To turn a blind eye to what's right and wrong? To, to say it doesn't matter as long as he has the anointing? It must be God? Who cares? There are going to be so many pastors in hell, evangelists in hell, televangelists in hell, healing evangelists in hell. And they're going to be in hell. And there are going to be some people you would never even dream. Somebody who's on the street struggling not to drink, struggling not to take drugs, and they're going to be in heaven. And the pastor will be in hell. We've worshipped success. We've worshipped the cool. We worship the celebrity pastors. And we've made it a God and we turned a blind eye. We can no longer allow this. Please, if I ever go off, I'll never, ever, would ever come up here. If I ever would have committed something like that, or adultery, I'm done. I'll never go back in the pulpit again. Why? Because a man of God has to be above reproach. Sorry. And for the church to turn a blind eye towards pedophilia is disgusting, it's wretched, and it's sick. And we have to say enough. Now, it's easy to say it now. And listen, I, I, I followed this pastor. I like this pastor. I had no idea. It's, it's, it's horrible. Now, what do I say that for? Because it matters. Where are you with God? Where are you with God? God's not impressed with our with our talents and our abilities. God looks at our hearts. And, and many will say, Lord, I never knew you. And I will declare to them, what? I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these words, sayings of mine and does them, I will liken to the wise man who built his house on the rock. One day it's all gonna come. And will you stand? And the only way we can stand is with Jesus Christ. Do we all make mistakes? Absolutely. Does God forgive for mistakes? Absolutely. But what we've done is a pastor does something wrong. He takes two weeks off and starts a church down the street with his secretary. 
It's ridiculous. You got to stop this. God forgives, but doesn't mean you put the man back in the pulpit again. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Can we stop? Can we stop? What's the coolest church in town? Please, God help us. God help us. Can we stop that, everybody? Seriously. A church of 50 people is as valid as this church. Amen. It is. It really is. I thank God we're growing. We're able to do great things. It's fine. But it doesn't mean we're better. It doesn't make sense. Stop all this. Well, that's the hot church. Oh, please. Oh, the pastor's hot. Oh, give me a break. Your pastor's bald. Ah, come on. <laughs> and plays guitar. Okay. But... Uh, all kidding aside, we need, we need to end today, uh, but I want to end with this, and I hope, I hope I brought some clarity to some things, uh, that, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? Either you're in a place called paradise or you're in a place called Hades, and one day he's going to come back, and when he does, then Christ is going to rise with glorified bodies, and then there's all types of things that will take place afterwards, which I don't have time today to tell you, but I want you to be rest assured, be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord if you've given your life to Jesus. The question is, have you given your life to Jesus? And I should bow your head, close your eyes. Father, I thank you so much for today. Lord, there's so much we are talking about today. And Lord, I, I recognize, Father, I stand up here on the stage and I don't think I'm better than any pastor in America or any pastor in the world. And Lord, do I, nor do I think I'm better than the pastor that fell. But Lord Jesus, we don't want to, Lord, forgive us for making an idol out of success. Forgive us for making an idol out of anointing making an idol out of effectiveness, making an idol out of good business models, making an idol out of clever marketing. Lord, we don't want to be about that. Father, we want to love you with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind, and our strength. Father, I humbly recognize that without you, I cannot do anything, and neither can anyone in this place. I ask your blessing to be upon every person in this church right now, Father. And Lord, I pray that you would, this Holy Spirit, touch every heart. Lord, I pray that you would just show anyone, is anyone in this place right now that is not right with you? Father, I thank you, Father, that we don't have to get perfect. We have to get surrendered. Lord, you're not asking us to be perfect. You're asking us to be surrendered. Lord, you're asking us to believe that you're the Son of God and that you rose again from the dead. And you're asking us to bow our knee to you and say, I no longer live. Christ lives in me.